Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about public lands and national parks and the challenges that they're facing in the, amid the country's continued emergence from the pandemic. Our special guests are Teresa Pirno, President and CEO of the National Parks Conservation Association, Christine Lennertz, President and CEO of the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, and Laura Heron, CEO and President of ACE, the American Conservation Experience. So thank you all for joining us. It's great to see you. And uh, just to set you up, um, if you take a look back at, at uh, Teddy Roosevelt's essential creation of the modern national park systems, our natural lands have been viewed as an American treasure. So today we're seeing an ecological disaster in terms of fires, droughts, and other climatic and human impacts unfolding before our eyes. So let's talk about why Americans of all stripes, including business interests, energy companies, ranchers, and others should be really concerned about conserving our national parks and other lands. So let's start with you, uh, Teresa. Um, how do you see the way Americans' attitudes are evolving uh, uh, right now, given what we're all uh, experiencing? Well, well, thank you. And thank you for having me on the program. Um, you know, I think that COVID made everybody realize um, how important the outdoors and parks and open spaces are. And so we saw a huge surge um, over the last year and a half in really people getting out into their national parks. And I think as they've gotten out, they, they care about them even more than ever. And we're, we're seeing that. And we're also seeing, of course, the increase in fires, um, drought, you know, severe weather, temperatures in Death Valley, you know, continue to hit records and break records um, as it continues to rise. And so, you know, the impacts that we know are from climate change are really impacting our national parks um, severely with so many of our national parks being coastal marine parks. So impacts from sea level rise and, and the increased storms and hurricanes. And, and then of course our Western parks that are really being hit um, hard by fires. Um, but we're also seeing um, issues of development impact. Um, you know, we saw huge surges with oil and gas leasing and oil and gas development. And so many of our national parks, you know, they're not, they're not islands. They, they depend very much on the entire uh, land around the parks in order to really be healthy. And wildlife doesn't know about park boundaries. So the impacts that are happening to um, wildlife in our national parks, wildlife corridors, all of those things are having a really significant impact um, on people's visitor experience. So it's, it's important that we look for solutions and ways that we can continue to um, you know, reduce our fossil fuels and, and continue to do things in a very important environmental way um, to protect these, these critical places for all of us. Well, educated by leaders like yourselves, you know, I've, I've been saying for years that our natural resources are limited, but it's really struck home with the fires. Uh, Christine, if you, if you take a look at all the fires that we've been suffering here throughout the West, um, it is really clear when you drive down roads that we have a limited resources and whole swaths of those resources are being burned up. How are you taking um, a, a cut at getting people involved in the solution mm -hmm. and on the preservation? Uh, of, of these lands uh, at the national at the Golden Gate National Conservancy. You know, Mark, here at the Golden Gate uh, National Parks Conservancy, the idea that we connect people to parks is really the greatest power that I have. I, I think that we all have. We have almost 330 million people who can really steward the parks, who can really think about the choices that they make every day that will help us get through this era. I, I think that we care about parks because they're a bellwether. They tell us when you're a large natural landscape, they help us to understand what it means to see climate change impacts on the ground, to see what a snowmageddon means, uh, a, a rain event on snow, those things that are so substantially different than our natural areas have seen over the more than 100 years of the national park system and more than a, almost 150 years, Yellowstone's gonna be 150 years old next year. So when we think about in the area where we are in the Bay Area, 
we have access to hundreds of thousands of people who connect with national parks. As Teresa said, this COVID era has connected people with these spaces on a really personal level. So I think that human connection is a big part of the solution when we can get people serving on lands, visiting lands, inspired by lands, and really understanding what the future holds for us if we don't make those connections really meaningful. And you're setting up Laura, right? I mean, there's this whole <laughs> idea of, uh, we, we planned this all, you know, before it was a nefarious yeah. uh, discussion. Um, Laura, you, your organization gets people involved, right? It's particularly young people. Talk about how you take um, this idea and transform it into an experience. Absolutely. And again, thank you for, for pulling this wonderful group together. I'm honored to be a part of it. it I, I think about it this way. The, the Conservation Corps movement began because Liz Putnam, who founded the Student Conservation Association, talked about the perch being loved to death. And that was the beginning of, of all of this and understanding the power of young people to, to make change. And that's what we do. We combine um, getting young people out, actually doing some of this backlog maintenance, doing the visitor services and education, because what we have seen with COVID is exactly what, what both Teresa and, and Christine talked about is the impact, the unintended consequences of many more people out on the land and on the trails. We've seen trails, for example, that are like three and four times as wide as they should be. So, so the damage of more people are not understanding. You know, we experienced fire directly. We lost um, a camp in Big Basin State Park in California last year where we had things. So we continue to really think about that next generation. And that next generation is, is different every time. And it's a generation of digital natives. So thinking about the parks in that hands-on experience that we provide, and then technology and how do we bridge that? So we have all the, you know, we want the parks to be there for everybody, but we also want informed and, and wise usage of our of these resources because they are finite and when they're gone, they're gone. So that, that's sort of where we come at this of trying to provide those opportunities for young people so they become that next generation of stewards and leaders and are sitting in these chairs in the next iteration of, of this and, and other you know, great opportunities. And as we become more urban, I think we have we have different uh, uh, questions, and uh, our experiences need to be uh, somewhat different. Um, I have a real question about this idea of connecting people to parks. If um, we are uh, increasingly living urban, interconnected lives, which are informed by technology and not ne necessarily nature, um, how do we actually uh, change how we function? in order to connect people because our constituents are far more diverse. They're ethnically diverse, they're religiously diverse, they're experientially diverse, right? The, the idea of inclusion means that you have to meet people where they are, yet so often the attitudes in the environmental movement are informed by uh, people who have an experience that is not quite the same as the people we're trying to engage. Uh, Teresa, you're you're very familiar with this this idea. How are you changing your staff, your board, your programs in order to help people become engaged? So I think it really starts with um, with making sure that the programs and what your priorities are, are really focused on the needs of the broader community. And so, you know, for so long, the national parks didn't tell the stories that really represent all Americans. So we have focused now for, um, you know, the last couple decades and particularly um, more than the last decade to really focus on what are those stories that we're not hearing about, about women, about people of color. You know, we worked really hard for Pullman to come on board, the first um, LGBTQ site in Stonewall, as well as Birmingham and, and Harriet Tubman and um, Cesar Chavez and all these stories that are so important for people to see themselves in our national parks and hear the history told. So that is critical as well as working to engage younger diverse audiences. Um, we created something called the Next Generation Advisory Council about seven years ago. And 
what that has brought to our organization and being able to really commit and work on projects um, and continuing to bring in diverse fellows, um, as well as our staff now is about 38% people of color. Um, and we continue to um, build a board that is very diverse because you, know, you have to address it at every level. So in, in staffing and, and then people in parks, we need to work with the national park system so that there are, is diversity within the national park system, which has really struggled um, to really change that culture. And that is critical. If we're gonna be successful in really connecting people to urban parks, there's parks in every state and there's parks in cities across this country. And um, we just need to be welcoming and we need to really make sure that they're seeing their own stories in themselves in these places. So we just completed a poll which, uh, and, and the conclusion of the poll uh, was that um, 90% of the people responding said natural lands are essential, essential to American identity, and the other 10% said very important. So if we're talking about essential, this idea of inclusion and being able to tell the story from different perspectives is so important. And Christine, you have an additional uh, challenge in that um, your, your organization is um, working with uh, people from urban areas in close proximity to uh, vast natural lands and then the Golden Gate uh, National, uh, uh, National Park is, um, is very diverse itself. Um, when you're talking to people who either are visitors to this area from different parts, parts of the world, when you're talking about uh, kids who basically are inner city kids, um, how do your programs help to shift um, uh, their perceptions and also meet them where they are. In other words, informed by their current sensibility so that they can be um, brought into yours. Mark has such a great intersectionality question, right? And like Laura, we have had the opportunity for nearly a generation to work with youth in the Bay Area. 750,000 young people have come through what's known as our Christie Field Center, which is about youth education, youth leadership, and this connection to nature. And they have shown us they have taught us through the years that this intersection of past, present, and future is where they see themselves. So when they walk into a park, and, and we know that history is written every day in a park, but who holds the pen? It's giving up the pen. I was really lucky to work with the National Park Service for over a dozen years in Yellowstone and Grand Canyon, uh, in parks all across the West. And I can tell you that a wonderful organization in the National Park Service has still created parks in our own image, like we are on the screen today, as opposed to thinking about the co-creation of these lands in, in, in terms of honoring who was here before, when we think of the Ramatishalone, when we think of the coastal Miwok here on the western part of San Francisco in the Bay, we have young people coming to us saying, we want to learn about that story from the past and understand what it means in today's terms, social justice, environmental justice, colonialism, this divide in economics that we see so severely in the San Francisco and Bay Area, parks are free here. You can come into 84,000 acres onto the Presidio for free. And how we make this an opportunity of choice for people, truly we're learning from the generations that are rising now into the leadership of environment and national parks. That's really interesting, the idea of giving up the pen, right? Giving up, giving up the ability to tell the story. So when, when you think about giving up the pen, how does that function? How, does that mean that your, your uh, programs, the content of your programs, are you giving up the pen in terms of writing the scripts for those programs, Laura, when you're, when you're thinking about what kind of experiences young people are going to have? Are the young people themselves able to define those experiences? in terms of what's important to them? I, yes, and I, I, I hadn't heard that term, but I really, it resonates with my extra pen. Um, I think the, the experiences evolve as, as our world changes. Um, we, again, as a, as a partner of the Park Service have, have been doing some work to, to also expand and be more welcoming, doing our own internal work, but also working on some pretty important partnerships with the Park Service that help uh, young people from different backgrounds understand what, what what it's like to work for the service because 
it, it's what we found is it hasn't changed over the years. The, the demographics haven't changed. So we've been working on some very deliberate programs that, that bring a cohort of, of young people together from different backgrounds and bring Park Service employees from different backgrounds. So they- Are you trying to recruit people who are going through your program? Are you trying to give them an, an idea that this could be their profession as well? Absolutely, absolutely. And we have various ways to help them do that, to, to be that pipeline. But it's also giving them a, a realistic picture that it, the park service is not just a park ranger out in the back end. It can be, it can be a plumber, electrician, admin. There's so many. There's such a vast um, opportunities. So we're using some of these program models to help build that pipeline for young people uh, and give them an, and give them the chance that they might not have ever thought of. Um, that's the other thing is getting ensuring that people we all understand that conservation can be right in your backyard. It doesn't have to be somewhere else. And I think that that's a really important, whether it's a national park, your local park, but it's right where you are. And we've, we're, we're, we're trying to really think about how the different ways to embrace that as well. I want to ask you three a question. Um, uh, I, I had a really interesting experience. We were doing some work for one of the largest conservation organizations in the world. Uh, we, were, we, we were recruiting um, a, a, a executive there. And the thing that struck me is that when we were talking about uh, inclusivity, I got a lot of lectures from, uh, from leadership, uh, which basically comes from a scientific conservation tradition about how wrong everybody else was to think about conservation in terms that did not align to the traditions of that particular organization, which was really interesting mm -hmm. because each of us have, each of our organizations has its own traditions, has its own thinking. You know, Audubon has its thread. Um, Sierra Club has its thread. TNC has its thread, right? And you all have your threads. How do you change a culture when, of course, the people who are there currently come out of a particular tradition? How do you evolve that? Do you create change agents within your organization? Or are you trying to get people together to think in different terms? Christine, do you bring people in who have different perspectives to help uh, leaven that, that picture? How, how do you do it? Mark, I think you're right on that. There's this collective effort we need to make. Uh, what we know is when you come to the table, you bring unique skills and a mission but you also bring things that you share in common with others in the world. Think about traditional ecological knowledge. That's something that's coming to the forefront in conservation and preservation from tribes around the, the world, really, to say there are stories that we've handed down verbally through generations about this ecology, this landscape. And so I think, though, there is a tendency sometimes to think my nonprofit or my mission or my vision is the right one for this time, we actually see when we bring people together in collaboratives, we have a wonderful California landscape stewardship network that's bringing people together for the first time across California to say, this is a big complex issue with wildland fire. It is a big complex issue with climate change. We can no longer do that alone. And we can also no longer do it as only the government sector or only a social sector or only the private sector. It is a combination of communities that have to be at the heart of that as well as the tools that each of those sectors bring to magnify, to amplify. If we have an opportunity ahead, this next generation needs to inherit something different than what we've done in the past. And the go it alone, we just know isn't working anymore. So you're creating a culture of listening to different viewpoints and different ways of approaching the same problem. You know, we just completed a poll in which we said, what is the biggest benefits of having open public land in national state parks? And we, uh, non-commercial uh, human use uh, gone 53% and the rest were to promote uh, biodiversity. But when you take a look at the national parks, for example, uh, Teresa, there are a lot of different interests. There are recreational interests, so there are touristic interests. There are some mining interests. There are logging interests. You have a lot of different uses. So taking Christine's point about bringing different perspectives in and having that, having that dialogue to create a transfer of knowledge, do you also uh, bring in different interests, perhaps interests that are, that are not traditionally associated with conservation? But frankly, if, if trees burn down right across the West, it's going to affect 
the business interests, whether it's tourist, uh, you know, ecotourism or, or logging interests, is going to adversely affect a lot of different people. Do you bring people together to, to talk about these kinds of issues? Um, absolutely. And uh, we actually brought together, in fact, a large coalition and we're ultimately successful with many others in getting the Great American Outdoors Act passed that actually supported funding and really helped to boost um, some of the needs of parks. But, you know, even through- Could you, um, explain, could you just explain that, because th this is a really, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, voted on by both, it was supported by, by members of both parties. Huge right? bipartisan support. Um, but, you know, years in the making, um, decades really in the making um, to get that bill passed. But really, again, showing and bringing everybody to the table that the impacts that were happening and the fact that the neglect that was happening in our public lands, our national parks, um, and the, the lack of funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund was really having an, an enormous impact. And they finally you know, agreed, yes, it was, and six and a half billion dollars over five years. Um, you know, the fully funding, the 900 million a year of the Land and Water Conservation Fund as well, to really help um, get some of the maintenance issues under control. But of course, there's still huge needs at parks. But I think, you know, your point is, and I think what at the end of it, I loved the, um, you know, giving up the pen. At the end of the day, we have to do that. And we have to change who's sitting around the table because otherwise as an organization, it's impossible to really change if, if you don't really make sure that you have and are inclusive, as well as looking at your own policies, looking really internally at your own history. And when we celebrated our own centennial 100 years just a couple years ago, we looked really and, and spoke about some of that history, that we weren't always on the right side of history. Many times we didn't look at the impacts, whether it was to the Native American community or you know when we supported um, a certain project. And so you, know, you kind of have to, you have to really speak about that and own that. And then you have to say, okay, what are you doing differently moving forward and make a commitment um, to really true inclusivity, um, which means you know everybody has to be at the table. We have to have these these conversations, and we have to listen. And well, it's, I, I, I could build on that a little bit. Uh, and it's a lot of work. It's not a checkbox. I think that's where we're at. You know, we we've been really looking at our internal culture and how how we can change. And we've brought on a senior level staff person, for example, from the Park Service. Uh, to help us to help us do this work, but as we talk about internally, it's work, and it's not. It might never be done, you know. As we look at, as you said, Teresa, our policies, our procedures, it's just our language, how we how we talk about things. There's there's just so much to do, and and right now, what we're really looking at is how do we move start to move that needle, and not expecting that. It's, it's going to change overnight, but but putting in the effort, rolling up our sleeves, and not just being quite honestly a hashtag. Um, that's that's been important to, for us to think about is diving in and really focusing internally first, so that then we can be better looking outwards. In a sense, uh, don't you have to shape a staff that is ready to, um, as they do their work, transition their teams on a continual basis so that we remain aligned to the current environment in which we, we operate, right? So in a, in a sense, we're creating teams that are not uh, focused on their own comfort and their own um, uh, co confirming their own opinions, but constantly collecting information on other people's opinions, other people's perspectives. And how do you shape those different perspectives into a program that advances conservation? Right? Is, is, that what you're, is that what you're basically talking about in terms of it being work, Laura? Yeah. That, that you're constantly being informed by new data? New data and, and getting out, out of our own way. That my vision of conservation may be different than Trish, it may be different than yours or Christian's. And that doesn't make that invalid. Um, hunting and fishing, great example very big conservationist. That may not be how I think of it, but it's really broadening how we look at these and embracing that and not and not just saying, well, this is this is conservation. Conservation can be ugly sometimes, you know, it, it's not necessarily all the, the, the glamorous things. It, it could be 
having because the greatest killing pussy cats and rats and invasive yes. species, right? And blind I mean, squirrels, and exactly. Um, feral hogs. So there's there's lots of pieces of conservation that may not fit our vision, but we have to embrace that larger, um, and that hopefully will bring in more people. Uh, you know, opening, being more welcoming, being more inclusive, and not saying, "Well, you're a hunter, so we don't want you." as a part of our vision of conservation. So that, that's, those are some of the things we think about. You know, uh, as we look at, at our lands, our natural lands, our, our air, our water, um, I, I have a feeling over the last, uh, particularly decades, we have a nibbling away issue um, at natural lands that around the borders at first, and sometimes it's not even nibbling away, sometimes it's, it's tens of thousands of acres if you take a look at the Amazon. Um, we are constantly trying to push back on a diminishing resource. Uh, Christine, is, is there a way to flip that script in which um, we can add to parks um, and, and add to our conserved spaces uh, in, as part of this solution? I think we have to. When we think about you know, the 3030 initiative in the Biden administration, when we think of ways to take the lands that are set aside, not just in national parks, although those are meant to be in perpetuity, we have to think the partnerships with agricultural lands. We need to think of the partnerships all around parks. When you think of um, you know, the Yukon to Yellowstone, when you think of wildlife corridors, when you think of air sheds and what it means to protect the air, that is emitted from one location today, but travels to another part of the nation or another part of the globe. And so it is a, it is a complex issue we face, uh, significantly more complex when you look at our loss of biodiversity. But I have to tell you, I am, I am really enthused by this generation. When you look at, at the young people coming through our program, it almost feels to me like uh, talking to young people in the parks and we're getting them back in the parks in person again, is that they see a longer future than we've ever seen in, in my generation, in the generation that comes just after me. And so they are, I, I believe, thinking about how to work both the brake and the accelerator. So the, the, the brakes to slow the, the, the changing world that we see that's impeding on the natural experience and the accelerator on what these experiences mean for people, what they mean in terms of their spirit. We know there's hundreds of stories that talk about the benefits of these open places, these natural areas to health, to our mental health, to our physical health. And so I think this idea that it can't just be the gas pedal or just be the brake, and that we have people who are seeing that combination differently, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. Uh, well, from your from your lips to God's ear, uh, we just completed a uh, a uh, a third poll in which we asked how often did people uh, attending visit the national parks, and we had uh, thirty nine percent say monthly and and forty eight percent said annually. Um, now this is a select audience, but I, I think people are very much uh, connected to to these parks. Teresa, we're going to let you uh, see us out. Uh, what do you think the future holds in terms of being able to uh, create uh, recovery in lands that have been damaged and add to the parks. You know, I think back at, at uh, the Adirondacks, which were a devastated region by, um, by uh, timber harvesting for construction and coal, and really did come back through the uh, long-term stewardship of citizens all across New York State and all across the nation. Uh, how do you see the future uh, evolving in the national parks? I, I actually, I mean, I completely agree with um, Christine. I think that the reality is our planet is resilient. And the fact is that with what we see in the efforts under being undertaken, we can recover and we can protect um, our parks and our public lands so that they'll be here for generations. But it is going to take doing things differently. And it's certainly um, our youth gives me hope as well that we're going to get there, but it's going to take a lot of work and our 30 by 30 support and all of us, you know, getting on board on, and, and living and really um, showing that we're willing to do things differently by making changes in our own lives. And parks are a great place for people to come and to learn about some of these new things that they can do, as well as the importance of really protecting these uh, treasured spaces. So 
let's hope that we'll all continue and, and continue to work and, and make sure that we um, really treasure our national parks. I wanna, I wanna make a point. It can be sometimes small acts, right? I write with this. I fill ink into a pen and I reuse the pen. I don't throw it away. It's, it, it, I started to do it just, just as, a, as something to think about, not throwing away things, right? And you see about plastics uh, polluting our ocean and so on. So I just started doing it in that, in that way. It was just some, a small thing to make me think a little bit, to make me be a little bit more deliberate. And I learned that from somebody else who basically said the same thing to me. Um, so I think that it, it really is the small act. It's being involved in an organization like yours, Laura, like yours, Christine, like yours, uh, Teresa. It's, it's, um, it's talking with people like we're doing today. It's advocating a little bit and just changing a little bit every day. And maybe at the end of the day, we end up with more natural lands and, and lands, lands in a better state. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Teresa Perno, President and CEO of the National Parks Conservation Association, Christine Lennertz, uh, President and CEO of the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, and Laura uh, Heron, uh, President and CEO of ACE, the American Conservation Experience. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Uh, attendees, thank you very much for uh, coming together and for participating in this. Everybody have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks all.